an Australian native, the Owen gun was a World War II development at a time when there was an acute shortage of submachine guns. Because of the new demands in Blitzkrieg-style warfare and close-quarter jungle fighting on Australia's northern doorstep. Initially, it was designated a submachine gun, along with the Austin, like the Tommy gun. However, British nomenclature considered these pistol calibre, low-recoil weapons as machine carbines, which is much closer to the service application and performance characteristics. The Owen acquired a reputation for reliability under extreme conditions. It was easily loaded, had good balance for instinctive fire from the shoulder or the hip, it was compact and readily controlled in burst fire because of its construction and weight. It was also disassembled easily for cleaning and maintenance. Its origin embodies some folklore. A homegrown 22 rimfire built by a Wollongong young man, Evelyn Owen, who had just enlisted in the AIF. Secreted in a hessian bag outside his room, it was discovered by his neighbour, Jerry Wardell, the chief engineer at the local Lysart's sheet metal factory. Guessing that it was Evo's, Evelyn Owen's nickname, and knowing his next-door neighbour to be keen on firearms, Jerry and his brother Vincent Wardell applied basic physics and production acumen to improve its operation and reliability. The drum magazine was done away with, and a vertical stick magazine feeding from the top, using gravity to feed and help eject the cases. Wartime shortages saw pistol calibre ammunition hard to obtain, so initial tests were chambered for 32 ACP. This was at a definite disadvantage with its competitors, the 9mm Sten and 45 calibre Thompson. Development was hindered by the Army Directorate, who had interest in the British Sten and its local variant, the Austin. Following Owen toolroom models at Lysarts were built up for rimmed 380 and 455 revolver ammunition, and then the 45 ACP. Rimmed cartridge rounds were virtually impossible to feed from a stick magazine, but Lysarts overcame them, and test models performed exceptionally well. Of course, when the 9mm Parabellum was decided upon, it was full steam ahead, and the Owen excelled in sand, mud and water, without stoppages. Initial production commenced in October of 1941 with an order of 2,000 guns and evolved through alternatives in butt and barrel fixtures along with the skeleton or lightened body too. Lysarts at Port Kembla produced a total of 45,433 Owen guns, according to the Munitions Digest, with termination of the contracts in mid-1945. Unlike the 9mm Sten and Austin, no special loading tool was needed for the staggered row box magazine. The sturdy 33 round magazine was instructed to be filled with 32 rounds, easily loaded with the fingers and thumb. Automatic or repetition fire was selected by rotating a change lever bar on the left side of the body, conveniently just above the trigger. Set at the forward recess is automatic. The centre recess is for single rounds, repetition, while safe is at the rearmost setting. The gun cannot be cocked with the change lever set at safe. Mounting the magazine directly on top complements feed, but this would normally obscure the sights. Wardell merely offset the front and back sights, as this was not so critical for a close quarter weapon. The Owen was designed by experienced factory production engineers, and its fabrication from sheet steel and tubing enhanced its durability and ease of production, outside the traditional munitions establishments. Raising the plunger at the top front end of the body tube, it allows the barrel to be taken off the cleaner, with removal of the breech block loop through the front of the body tube. This was another feature that made the Owen popular with frontline troops, especially those serving under extreme tropical conditions. The original Lysart's knife bayonet saw little service. Post-World War II FTR programs at SAF Lithgow saw a fixture around the barrel to attach a shortened pattern 1907 type bayonet with 10 inch or less common 8 inch blade. Training pamphlets describe A short range weapon, the gun was introduced for the purpose of engaging targets at ranges from 10 to about 100 yards. At greater distances the speed of the bullet is so reduced that it has lost much of its ballistic efficiency. The weapon can be carried in any convenient position, but when expecting to meet the enemy, it should be held at the waist. From this position, it can be instantly aligned and fired, or, time permitting, it can be fired from the shoulder. 
Although the weapon can be fired whilst on the move, greater accuracy is assured by halting momentarily to do so. Owing to the speed with which single rounds can be fired, the greater accuracy possible by this method and the need for economy of ammunition, single round firing will be employed wherever possible. Bursts should be reserved for extreme emergencies or suitable targets, and when used, should be of two to three rounds only. Longer bursts will result in the displacement of the weapon's line and elevation, and, except at extremely short ranges and against a dense target, will produce little or no material effect, besides placing the firer at a definite disadvantage through wastage of vital ammunition, entailing loss of time in reloading, etc. For targets at about 25 yards, the weapon should be fired from the weight by sense of direction. For ranges between 30 and 100 yards, if time permits, and should be taken. Whichever method is used, an attempt should be made to observe the strike of the bullet, as this is the only sound method of making the necessary correction. Having disposed of the enemy, the weapon can be made safe for movement by removing the magazine, easing the cocking handle forward, and placing on a full magazine. Submachine guns are automatic weapons, operated usually by the recoil of a fired case, acting on the face of the breech block or its equivalent. Bursts or single rounds can be fired, and where the weapon is of 9mm calibre, most makes of that ammunition, including captured German and Italian, can be used. It must, however, be realised that the cartridge used is essentially a pistol cartridge, Therefore, the weapon cannot logically be regarded as a light machine gun or an automatic rifle.
Official designation of marks and models, along with those later stamped at Lithgow during the FTR program, can make relative designations confusing. This was because of its wartime production outside the regular munitions establishments and the requirement to get badly needed Owen guns to the front line, and then the later restamping at Lithgow after World War II. It was left to the service hierarchy to sort these things out after the end of the war. Essentially, pre-1945 production without the bayonet bracket and safety slide were Mark Ones. The Mark I star has a lightened body, while Lysart used the year after their mark designation, such as 1 slash 42, 1 slash 43 and 1 slash 44 for the stamped body designations. Trials models can further confuse the issue, but our Small Arms Identification Series number 3 on the Owen and Austin tabulates these changes and progressions. My Australian Service Machine Guns book also describes this evolution and history. The official designations were announced in the Australian list of changes in war material in 1946. The Mark II is described as a regular service Mark I and Mark I star lightning models, further compounded by Marks II-1, II-2 and II-3 designations that were applied later on. Most post-war FTR guns are noted stamped as Mark II-3. Such confusion regarding what was officially named was really irrelevant for those users in the field. They only wanted a reliable weapon, which the Owen certainly was, through decades of service. Full strip of Owen Mark I. Start off by taking the barrel out. It comes out in the front, but take off the butt. We're going to um, take out the cocking piece, so you're looking up the bolt and it comes out the front as well. So to do that we have to lift up the, the, the cocking handle and release it. No longer attach the piston on the back of the cocking of the bolt. Pull up the release catch and slide it forward out the front with the spring attached. Then we're going to take over, turn it over and take off the, the butt group. And inside that is all the sear and safety catch and trigger. So inside here's the cocking piece and um, inside this tube uh, you've got the collar at the back here, the piston slides in and out uh, and into, that's the bearing surface so there was no dirt got inside where the, the bolt is because all the dirt was sealed off with the magazine and the bolt. Pistol grips are held on with a longitudinal screw and are removed by undoing the screwdriver. And they've got a spring and a catch system on there, so I won't take that off because I have to put it back on again. Some cleaning, a bit of lighter oiling of some of the parts before we reassemble and all the outside inside the tube just check how clean it is it is actually quite clean so we're going to just put a bit of light oil around inside and a bit hard to take uh, put the oil inside the back part there without the taking out the piss the the cocking piece cocking piece removed by just tapping off the back cap and uh, oil and clean just lightly around the sear and trigger section and safety catch. Might just put a wee bit of oil inside there. A couple of pins in there that need a bit of oil. And we'll check the barrel. Now putting it back together again, everything goes in reverse. So we're going to put the button or pistol group back on. Screw on. And 
just nip that tight. Now this goes in so that the hole for the fucking handle sits on the right hand side so there's the groove to strip the magazine so we need to put this in at the front with it facing up holding open the release catch sliding it back just to get that turned around special armourers tool for pushing the uh, bolt back <coughs> located on to the piston locks in place Right, 